everyone. Let's get started. My name is Gail Taylor, and I'm a member of Kent Street Coalition, and I would like to welcome you to the meeting tonight. Um, this is the fifth, I believe, fifth of um, our 12 meetings, uh, educational Zoom conferences designed specifically for our state candidates. Our topic tonight is immigration. Our speakers are Latha Manjapudi, she's the state rep from Nashua, Hillsborough 35, and on the state and federal relations uh, committee and vets committee, and um, Eva Castillo, who's the director of the New Hampshire Alliance for Immigrants. Welcome, Latha. Welcome, Eva. Thank you. Yeah, thank you all for joining, especially those of you running for the House for the first time. The session is being recorded and is available on the Kent Street YouTube channel, and the documents are available in the Google Drive. Um, any questions that you have, put them in the chat box and we'll address them at the end. If you would all mute yourselves, except for our two panelists, that would be great. And um, now I'll just turn it over to Eva and Latha. Welcome. Thank you. You wanna start Latha or do you want me to start? You go ahead, my friend, you can start it. <laughs> okay. Hi, everybody. Thank Hi. you for inviting me, Kent Street Coalition. And um, I commend you for inviting uh, immigrants to talk about immigration instead of non-immigrants to talk about us. <laughs> Nothing about us without us. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And thank you for the, to the candidates for, for coming here. So I was asked to talk a little bit about the uh, the situation for immigrants right now at the present moment in New Hampshire. Um, I sent uh, before a great study by the um, by a group that studies the economic benefits of uh, uh, new, the new Americans in New Hampshire. Uh, that was done in. 2014, so it has great information about all kinds of things, the education, uh, the employment, everything. So I invite you, if you wanna learn a little bit more about who immigrants are in New Hampshire and all the the benefits that we give to, to our state, uh, you know, read it and, and you'll see. Uh, to start with, I'll let you know that uh, there is about 80,000 foreign born people in New Hampshire and roughly 55% of them are naturalized citizens. So you do have a good pool of voters uh, that largely go, igno are ignored by the parties. You know, I was just reading a, a, post, a Facebook post by one of my Latino friends and he said, yeah, we only count every two years for election. And I said, that's why I don't do party politics. You know, so it's about time that, that both parties would really take us more into consideration uh, because we are uh, uh, increasingly more and more, uh, you know, we can really make it to, to, you know, help a candidate a lot if we're taking into consideration more than every election. Uh, one of my biggest frustrations right now in the presidential election is that there's no information about voter registration, how to vote at 17, nothing in other languages. We are a resettlement community here. We, we our government chose to be a resettlement community. So we owe it to these people to, to let them it, to give them the information in the languages, at least the main languages, that uh, you know that will help them navigate the systems. So that's one of my biggest pet peeves, and they count on us. Like I just translated last night a bunch of information for the, uh, you know, to to help people navigate the system. Uh, like Manchester, where I live, has eighty some languages. You know, but at least the main languages should be translated. There's no reason why uh, we cannot, as a state, include immigrants in, in, in the voting process. 
another thing that's going on really that that really troubles me is the state of racism and xenophobia that's going on right now for immigrants it's something you know i've been in new hampshire since 1982 and uh, i have never really i have i've had incidents because working as an immigrant rights advocate i'm always out there uh, so I've been told to go home many times and just random stuff like that, which is just part of the picture. But now when people, you know, go out of their way to insult me because I'm speaking Spanish uh, or, you know, that is not acceptable. This is not the, this is not the country that I swore allegiance to. Uh, it, it is really, it's getting out of hand. Uh, and I, it, this is nothing no, this is this was not created by the present administration. But what the present administration did was make it acceptable. And uh, you know, it, I think I see the jobs of the of the receiving community, like I call the Americans, the main community. You know, you really have a job in making sure that we put the lid back. On those on those racist people and and make it totally unacceptable. The 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 atmosphere is not conducive for diversity. And now diversity is a new code word, a buzzword. Everybody's talking about diversifying, diversity commission, diversity. This the the companies want diversity, but I want you to think about it. Are we really up to being diverse, or you just want diversity for the picture? You know, because many times I see that, that we're invited as tokens, the token Latino, and we're expected to just sit there and be quiet. Uh, you know, so, but the picture looks so pretty because I have an African and I have a Latino, but nobody's interested in, in knowing what we want, what we want or how we, you know, what we can contribute is just for the picture. Uh, and that's something where you have a role to. I see a lot of people that are really actively fighting for equ equity and fighting for all kinds of things, but they're not willing to really give an equal seat at the table, whether it is conscious or unconsciously. And that's something that you know affects us as immigrants. Uh, one of the biggest things I see is that we have tons of immigrants that have their careers back home like, it, for example, in like Manchester, when they had the, that uh, meatpacking plant there, the Tyson plant that was closed, you know, in 2006, five, something like that. You know, there were a lot of people from other countries that were working there, packing beef, that were attorneys, doctors, dentists, engineers, back in their own countries. And they were not given a, 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 any type of a chance to, to convalidate their careers or to, to get even a professional job, you know, so they were just shipped to, to pack meat. So we go back to racism and the double standard that everybody preaches one thing and practices another. Uh, so that is, you know, we need to really, we have a lot of wasted talent here. Uh, even young people in their 30s, and 40s that graduated overseas in, in other, you know, in careers. And I understand like, like if you're an attorney back in Venezuela or whatever, you cannot practice law here because we have such different laws. But if you're a doctor, if you're, you know, why give so many, put so many hurdles? If you're an engineer, I mean, numbers have no, no language. So why are people not given the chance and why do we still put in so many so many barriers for people to access uh, or to exercise their their careers to uh, to give their talents to to our to our state we also have a big you know this covid thing has really brought to the table the inequities that we have uh, in 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 the systems like to access employment security, even though you have, you know, there's a 
website in Spanish or whatever that's part of in the website, you need to really be a computer wizard to find the Spanish to begin with. When you see it in the school system, you know, it is assumed that everybody has the, first of all, they, that everybody has internet, that everybody knows, has a computer, that everybody knows how to use a computer. Immigrants are being left out of the picture. Parents that come here, you know, escaping all kinds of issues and that are not educated themselves, that do not speak the language. How are they going to help their children? And a lot of these kids are U.S. born children. In fact, most of them are U.S. born children. And, and we are making a bunch of assumptions that, that really leave these people out. And, and then that is something, you know, that, that really bothers me. Like a lot of, you know, it, it, some of these the stimulus packages or whatever it is that, that people gave for, for uh, businesses, for everything. If, you know, the outreach was absolutely terrible. Nobody reached out to minority businesses to figure out how to help them navigate the system. So they're just put out there, but, but one more time, we're excluded from all, all those benefits. So you as state legislators should be more open to inclusion and more cognizant uh, of um, a population that is really being left out of the picture and that's not going anywhere. Uh, we are here to stay and, uh, and the, the better equipped we are to navigate systems and, and to integrate in this society in a positive way, the better off we're gonna be as a state. You do not want a whole generation of kids that are uneducated just because you failed to, to include them in the plans in, in how we access education here. Mm -hmm. So these are just some, some of my reflections on this. You know, I can go on and on uh, a lot, but I'd rather have you ask me questions if you have them um, or comments uh yeah we have uh several questions in the chat but how about if we wait yep just those until after a lot yeah great thank you very much eva thank you so much thank you so much eva i know you're a tireless selfless worker very hard working for the most vulnerable or i would call it the voiceless at the table so my name is Lata Mangipuri, and I see a lot of familiar colleagues from my House, uh, House of Representatives and some new faces. And, uh, you know, in the COVID situation, thank you, uh, Kent Street Coalition, for pulling this together. Um, immigrant, you know, this nation, when you think about the history of this nation, it, is, it was built on immigrants. And all of a sudden, or at least more recently, immigrants who don't, you know, who look like me, more like me than with fairer skin or blonder hair, um, seem to be getting a lot of pushback. Mm -hmm. So there are very unique challenges as an immigrant. I, you know, you have, uh, many of you have heard me speak. I've been in this, uh, in Nashua, most of my adult life, over 30 plus years. So this is the love place that I've lived my longest in my life. So to say that I'm still a newcomer, mm -hmm. look at me like with that eye glasses is kind of sometimes it's hurtful. And so, you know, yes, uh, you know, my heritage is, I come from a largest democracy. I have that uh, opportunity to uh, sail back and forth from uh, my motherland to host land or, you know, my home now. But this is my home. This is a home for my children who are both born here. They look like me. So no matter how, whether they were born here, brought up here, they are looked as new immigrants and you know we we raise them this covid has put a very different 
highlighted a lot of the underlying uh, uh, not so subtle racism, sexism, you name all the isms that were not, that are not favorable, that are not welcoming. You know, I'll give you an example. I'm serving my fourth term. And in the last, first two terms, I had brought uh, bills, are co-sponsored, and some of my colleagues on the other side of the aisle co-sponsored. Same colleagues. When I brought in the uh, uh, resolution for welcoming community, this uh, uh, term looked at me as I'm bringing in a sanctuary bill, I'm bringing in, I'm, it's about illegal uh, immigrants. And I have had personally have experienced people calling me you illegal idiots standing mm -hmm. with your hand up from my colleagues in the state house. It is, it is, I don't want to be the Debbie Downer, but that is my reality. And with the COVID, on a given day, I get at least three to four phone calls from professionals like uh, doctors or engineers. I have doctors who've been working frontline for 15 years on H1B and one man who's a physician, he said, I'm calling to let you know that I'm making all arrangements for my family. My kids were born and brought up here, but my family to go back to India if I die of COVID because they don't get anything. This is after being in this community for 15 years, 20 years. Just had another software company person calling. We have to let go of 30, H-1B visa uh, uh, engineers that we cannot keep them because we can't renew that. So, and, you know, even State Department, I talked to Employment Security uh, Commissioner. He said, oh, we have one individual who went to India and cannot come back. So we are mailing a laptop back so that he can continue. We need them. We need his service now. We can't, we can't bring him back. So immigration has become such a critical part and Eva covered it very well, harnessing the human potential. People who are here, who are, came here with, you know, back when my sister came here as a physician, she came directly as a matching program. She was matched, she was given a green card. Similarly for me, when I came in, in 85, I walked out of immigration uh, when I flew in with my green card. I never had to go back and get a renewed or any of those things. Now, even if you come legally, uh, it takes five, zero years, 50 years. If you come from India to get mm -hmm. a green card, five, zero. So yep. meanwhile, Everything, you know, you pay the taxes and you can see the statistics. So I can speak from Nashua's uh, community. Nashua's uh, population is about 90,000, of which 6% is Indian American, 14 to 16% is Latino. And then we have, you know, other so, uh, so, um, African countries, and uh, European countries. So our pop diversity or our immigrant population is close to 25 to 30% in Nashua. Mm -hmm. And just the contribution of the immigrant community who are working from, you know, and just one community has started over 100 business, founded 100 businesses and about two billion with the B, annual revenue. It's nothing, and you know, when we talk about the uh, taxes, real estate taxes. So, and how do I franchise, how do I get them? So I have been working really hard and uh, to bring these communities to come and vote, come and engage in the politics, political aspect, because political branch of a society, of a democracy is very critical. If 
now with the fear of ice and with the fear of being uh, uh, intimidated, you know, I've had that in my own world when there was, uh, uh, you know, uh, somebody saying I'm a poll watcher and of any new uh, registration and especially somebody when I ran first, um, my opponent made a comment that he felt like he was in New Delhi and, you know, people are coming out of the woodworks. And we, do we really know if they are real uh, uh, citizens or are they coming here to uh, register and, uh, in somebody else's name? So those kind of questions are asked even today. Yep. And so these, and you know, you have seen me speak on the uh, floor about how do we make people feel welcome? I mean, I can tell you personally, I never considered myself different. I served on the school board. I've served on the PTO. I was first one to you know, uh, volunteer for campaign, hosted several events in our home, all that to be part of the community. But now if somebody, if I go out, which I don't go out much now for, because of COVID, but if I go out grocery shopping or if I go out in the community, if somebody is looking at me for longer than what I thought, think is different, I kind of, you know, it's an unsettling feeling. Mm -hmm. And if I am feeling that way, who, you know, understands the process and I'm part of it, I cannot imagine what somebody who has just come here who doesn't know. I'll give you another example where I've had calls from uh, Indian community and people who have had minor fender bender in the parking lot, people have called the cops on saying, this is a hit and run. And, uh, and the damages when they were assessed, it was $500 to $800 body damage. But this is an accident and the person was uh, arrested and put in uh, jail for, you know, overnight. And that person was devastated. I was so afraid that he would commit suicide. Mm -hmm. The family was besides himself, themselves. So I had to walk him through, for, it took me 24 hours to get him to say, you know, this is not uh, end of uh, your career, end of your life. Let's see how we can get it. So those kind of, it could seem like a small thing, but for somebody who looks like me mm -hmm. to be in a foreign country or a foreign culture. And not, you know, I never felt that way before. I never, I was so happy to share my culture, my heritage and our home was welcome. I mean, open all the time. I always joked, we never had keys. I mean, or I don't know how many people had keys to our home because all the campaign workers and uh, canvassers would come. And, you know, I never, we never used to lock the doors. But that's not the feeling right now. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and, but think about it. In a primary race, for example, in Concord for Senate race or, um, county attorney or governor's race in Nashua, just to see, we have about 3,000 registered voters from uh, Indian heritage. And if I can mobilize, and that's what the pitch I use. You know, if you want a voice at the table, if you want a seat at the table, you need to come out and vote. You need to come and express. Don't come to me when you have a problem, but elect the right people so that you can uh, advocate and we can move forward. So there's a lot of work to do. Sometimes, uh, you know, I feel like because I'm a first generation immigrant, I'm very honored to, uh, you know, serve and have the opportunity to serve. And my father is looking up from there to say, you know, my 
the little girl is doing what I've taught, taught them to do because he was always one to say, um, you know, community at large, you know, civil disobedience or, uh, uh, you, know, you know, it started way back in, with Gandhi in South Africa for, uh, for people to get freedom, you know, people of color to get freedom. And he went back to India and I grew up with the words like Satyagraha, Yagna spirit. Satyagraha is what? Seeker of the truth. Civil disobedience, nonviolence movement. Mm -hmm. And you know, and also with this COVID and mental health issues, I've worked diligently to bring some of the th tools that we can do. Uh, we can have for people like, uh, you know, mental illness, stress reducing, and those kind of stuff. So instead of pushing and saying, this is America, melt with, you know, uh, integrate. I don't know what integration means. Yeah. Inclusion, is it bringing our strength and using that? I'm not saying India is perfect, but we have a lot of things that can bring and we can bring the positives to work it together, right? So yeah. I can go on, Yes. sorry, so anybody, nope. I, you know, and no, I'm, I'm very open. No question is a political, uh, not, you know, not a politically correct. Any questions or doubt, I'm more than happy to answer. And okay. you know, ask somebody, a little kids always come and ask me, why do you wear that dot? And, you know, I'm happy to explain, educate people. It's an education, an educating moment. So That's right. And that's what it's all about, you know, asking questions from the point of your curiosity, not judging yes. people, you know, and I agree with you. Inclusion is the word. Mel the melting pot is just a <clears throat> gooey thing that doesn't, you know, and, and this BS that oh, my family did it and we joined whatever, you know, that's a, well, I'm not going to say bad words, but... <laughs> Things. Well, speaking it, of it, asking it really questions, <laughs> Eva, Eva, you're, you're a champion. So. <laughs> okay, um, we do have a couple of questions in the chat, so why don't I go ahead with those. Um, first one's from Catherine, I don't know how you say, Haraki? Um, she yeah, said, actually, yeah, it's me. Uh, I am the wife of an immigrant. Um, a non-Christian uh, immigrant. And I respect fully what Eva is saying, Latha is saying, but I, I recognize New Hampshire is not Massachusetts. It's not California. It's not Maine or Vermont. We're New Hampshire. And we're talking local elections now, not yeah. federal. Right. So I'm trying to understand my husband. I just, I joke, I tease him that he only married me because he loved New Hampshire. <laughs> So uh, <laughs> that was 30 years ago. My point is, I, I'm doing so. I'm. I want to touch a different subject because I think in, uh, acceptance. Sometimes there's this image now: the immigrants are refugees. They're poor. They're victims. They're uneducated. They're this. They're that. They're, they need our. We need to help them. Um, they're aliens. Yep. I mean, yep. this connotation we have is so low, and we have people who are do need our help. I understand that, but I feel if New Hampshire did more to attract. My, we, we came, he came to this country, we did business other places. There are, you know, London is London because of billionaire business people who buy properties in London and, and New York as well. I'm saying New Hampshire is very beautiful, very unique, great education, very safe. It has weather that the rest of the world doesn't have. And your question is? How can we attract the up, a wealthy, educated immigrants that Why can help? Why don't we have to attract the wealthy people? The mentality. That Why do we have to attract wealthy people? First because, of all, because, because, so that all, it's, just, it's, it's the psychology of, to, to change people's minds. If people we are already, already educated successful. people here. SNU Pardon? does, SNU educate, you have to be a millionaire. My, my brother was educated here. I was educated here. We're millionaires at home. I grew up with maids. I grew up, not everybody that moves here 
is a, and that's a stereotype that were poor people that were exactly and, and i agree but that is the ignorance of the americas we are oh, here and we, so are we have to we have to bring the the, the, the ones with the millions too so the ones yes. with the millions get together with the ones who had the millions and then we show here. The picture that we're all types of people that will definitely help the stereotype that's but what we are to here say. but the and thing is see. people are still stereotyping us look at all the indian community here look at all there's tons of people that are educated that have look, money i live in hampton and, and they stereotype sea brokers that's okay. just how right. americans are I'm just okay we're going to go on to another question okay um just to answer catherine you yes you have a point it also, it's not just attracting, but you have to make them, I mean, why did I move to New Hampshire? Because of all the things that you uh, listed, you know, to raise my family, my, I, you know, my kids both were uh, born and uh, raised here in uh, Nashua. So back then it was more, it was very subtle. Right now it is not. So be cognizant when you see somebody, I mean, you understand that. So. How do we make people, you know, instead of staring back or asking, hey, this, you know, uh, you know, one comment I would say to, you know, which really offends me more now than before is, oh, you speak such good English. And I'd say, oh, I've just been, so what do you mean? Or I'd say, oh, I've just been here for over 30 years. Or I was educated in English medium. Yes, I have a special accent, but, do, am I not able to understand the language? So the minute you see somebody different understanding, you don't understand. Yeah. That stereotype has to change a little bit. Mm -hmm. That education mm -hmm. has to happen. Because you look different, somehow you are not educated, you're not well off, you're right. not capable of contribution. That's right. And you know, we go back to the racial stereotypes. If I call myself Eva Castillo, I'm treated one way. When I call myself Eva Turgeon, which is my married name, you know, oh, I'm treated so much better than Eva Castillo. Why do I have to deny my being a Latino woman just to fit in, you know? So we have a lack of acceptance and a lack of openness for people here mm -hmm. you know and people are not given the chance to have a professional job i have a friend that has a phd from harvard in education a puerto rican guy so u.s citizen by birth he was here for over a year trying to look for a job not even, they nobody hired him even as a as a teacher's assistant so he ended up moving to massachusetts within two weeks he became superintendent of a school district and those are the inequities and i can tell you 50 million things those are the inequities that we have here we have a very elegant way of being racist here you mm -hmm. know we have a very elegant way of putting hurdles and hurdles and hurdles not to give anybody an equal seat at the table mm -hmm. i know that and that's why you have to bring the wealthy immigrants first because i 100 percent right. agree with you okay let's move on to another one um but uh, Chris Schultz asks, uh, can we do a bill to shut down state police cooperation with ICE in all nonviolent circumstances, especially yes. the fake border checks on I-93, 20 miles south of the border? Yeah, and that's a very good question, Chris, um, because I have tried that and, you know, Nashua Police, I have worked very closely with the Chief of Police in Nashua PD, but, uh, you know, they're very you can't live in that bubble of just Nashua, right? If they drive over to either Hudson or any oh, neighborhood. Oh, they're nice now. <laughs> <laughs> I just met with their chief a couple of days ago. <laughs> yeah, so the thing is absolutely, and um, yeah, you bring out a very good point. It, it's very unnerving. I was driving, we were driving as a family in, in 93, and you know, coming back and uh, I had visitors uh, in my car, not this year, last year. And I said to my husband, I said, if they stop us for a thing, I am going to resist. And I said, I called Karen Ebel and I called a few friends and I said, they, if they're gonna arrest me, please watch out on uh, I-93. And, but, not everybody can do that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Not everybody can do that. And racial profiling, 
by uh, absolutely it happens every single day all the time every and, and also you know ice not only stops people all over the place now they go to the court houses yes. and tackle the people that are give, that are sent to court for driving without a driver's license they're yeah. sent to court to pay their fine and ice picks them up right there from the courthouse so we, you know so i've been working. tons of families torn apart because of that so we did have a bill anyway, we did have a resolution to study the impact of immigrant thing it you know it got tabled um, I am looking at, it would be great to do a bill. I know it gets stable, but it doesn't matter. We have to bring this conversation. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, you know, a bill to not arrest people when they're in the court, a bill with, uh, the, you know, to give driver's license to people who are driving without driver's license, but are contributing. So we, you know, there are a lot of different things that we could do, and the, some of the bills were there last year. The driver's uh, bill was there. So yes, and absolutely to build on it. That's one way of educating. Mm. And then uh, we can ask our colleagues to co-sponsor and not say they're all illegal idiots. And work on your state senators that did not we did, we did not have the support of the state senate for driver's licenses. Yeah. Mm. Eric Gallagher has an interesting question. What rate of immigration do we need to get to in order to become diverse enough to no longer be open to criticisms that we aren't representative enough of the nation to have the first in the nation primary? Uh, you know, I've, I've used that a lot, especially we have a good opportunity in our state to say, you know, oh, 19, it's not true. Well, we are always characterized as 98 or 99 percent white. That is not true. Mm -mm. And, you know, we have more than, I think it's close to 10%. Yep. Now. Mostly the immigration immigrants are in the uh, southern part of the state, um, but it doesn't matter. So southern part of the state is where the population is also. Most of the population, two thirds of New Hampshire is. So highlighting that. And, you know, you will see me on every, uh, you know, I used to be bipartisan. I used to go to both sides of the aisle before I became a state legislator. And uh, you would see, I would call myself the bridge, you know, the brown bridge between the, <laughs> you know, at the ca campaigns, but engaging the immigrant population, That's having right. conversations, asking what is on your um, mind right now? What is the most pressing Today, if you go ask the uh, newcomers, uh, like my community, visa, health uh, insurances, education for their kids, and the stress level of dealing with parents or loved ones being someplace else, they're not being able to take care, coming from a culture where you take care of your elderly. And that's a huge stressor, mm. huge stressor. And then, you know, domestic violence and uh, abuse, people are afraid to call because they, they are dependent on their spouses for the visa. So if they call, if they are being in an abusive situation, they won't call the uh, uh, police or the abuse hotline because they're afraid they're going to be deported. Yeah, and they will be, the way the laws are. Mm -hmm. And so it's very, very simple that have if those of you who are running go to an event where even if it is a couple of you know you may not see a whole group of people showing up because they are fearful of coming out but you know i always say if i can get five people from my community to an event i host in the house in our home i would call myself lucky but i was very surprised or very happy that in 2018 I was able to get 30 people to come when I hosted an event uh, for, you know, and then when I hosted an event for a gubernatorial candidate in February, I had 15 people from my community. So I was, you know, that's an improvement for me. Out of 6,000 people in Nashua, I was able to get 15 people in my home. Yeah. And if it is outside, it's not. What is it? What is that fear? Why are they fearful? 
because they don't want to be seen. They don't want to be, you know, we are happy, we, you know, if we don't want to rock the boat. Because many have had that uh, saying, go back to where you come from, including yeah. me. Yeah. yeah. If you oh, yeah. so highly of India, why don't you go back? Why do you need to be here? Yeah. Yeah, state reps have told me to go home. Uh, Baldassaro told one of my friends as a Navy vet one time that we weren't, and I see somebody running in, in uh, London Derry, good luck. Um, the, Baldassaro told my friend who's a Navy vet of 22 years serving the Navy vet, and she's a Panamanian dark woman. He told her, you know, the, uh, to go home, and she went up one side and down the other. You know, and told him, this is my home. I serve my country just like you serve it. I had another state rep tell me, you people came to pollute the blood of New Hampshire. Mm. That was in 2006. A very devout Catholic state rep that is still there. You know, I would never forget that. So when with that attitude, how are we going to feel welcoming mm. here? And who is going to have the guts to go testify? And who's going to have the guts? to, to yeah. put themselves, you know, through, through that anguish. Mm. And, you know, the other thing is also I want to bring up, yeah, my kids, my son just got married and he married, uh, 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 you know, his uh, love of his life with, you know, her heritage is German heritage. And we are so thrilled and she's such a wonderful individual, but I worry for them. I worry for my grandkids. Yeah. In this environment, I worry when they have kids, how are they going to be seen? And, yeah, that, you know, Louisa. Another, yeah, and biracial uh, couple where it's, uh, you know, uh, if it's a woman uh, from uh, Indian community marrying a non-Indian wife, she's been asked, are you nanny? Are you the nanny for the kids? Or, you know, uh, whose baby are you watching? Yeah. Uh, Luisa Handem Piet, I don't know, if that's how you say it, also um, is saying the same thing. She said she's running for state rep in Londonderry um, mm -hmm. in spite of death threats due to racism in 2018. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I thank stay away from Londonderry. Luisa, yeah. thank you for standing up. Thank you. Have you. A huge <laughs> thank challenge. you. God, God bless you. More power to you. You mm. got thank some you. fun. Thank you. It's, it's been a roller coaster because I've, I'm also being treated for cancer and I had to think twice about wow. running uh, uh, because I don't want them to feel like they, they managed to threaten me enough for me not to run again. So uh, I am running because I think my voice needs to be heard. I live in a community that's very racist. Um, not the people, but the elites that run it. I knock on doors, I knocked on thousands of doors, and people are not like that. It's the Al Baldassaros of this world. He's in my district. I'm running against Al Baldassaro. Good. Thank you. Thank you for stepping up. Anybody that exactly. In spite of being a very, very dark man, he could pass for a black man. He calls himself Italian, and he's racist against people of color, such as myself. Mm -hmm. And uh, Kamala Harris, you know, he questioned whether she was born here. When she came and you know, you know what he said about Hillary Clinton as well so it's been really difficult to deal with and not only him uh, the biggest elephant in the room is uh, Sharon Carson who is the senator oh, wow. from Londonderry her husband operates like a mob against people that are running on the democratic ticket so he started a lie against me and ran an ad on Facebook saying that I called Londonderry Republicans uh, Nazis. And I was in the primaries, there were 14 candidates. I made number four. I was the fourth candidate with the most votes. So they ran a series of ads against me and they pushed me down. All the, the Republicans that voted for me, I lost them. So I lost by less than 200 votes. Mm -hmm. I didn't get elected, but they're still uh, uh, aiming at, reducing my ability to speak it's like living in a fascist state i grew up in portugal <laughs> and uh under salazar so i understand what they're trying to do it's to shut people up and stop women and people of color from running mm. so that's right gary woods do you want to uh, did you say have something you want to say 
Uh, yes. Um, um, I'd like to focus on something positive, if we could. <laughs> Realizing that the negative provides us with the problem that we need to solve. But if we over-focus on the negative, we'll never get to the positive. So what I would like to say is, let's take the negatives and ask ourselves, as legislators, uh, as individuals, what is it that we can do that is in fact positive? I've been involved with several situations with immigrants as a physician, uh, and they turned out very well. Um, but we have to ask ourselves, what is it that we need to be doing, not just what is it that's wrong? And I, I don't mean to in any way diminish the immensity and the emotional difficulty of this problem. I don't want to do that in any way. Well, but I, want to be but I would thank you for to, pointing let me, out. Let me finish. Yeah. Uh, I think we need to sort of ask ourselves, yet yeah, that we can co-sponsor a bill, yes, but what, what are the other positive things that we have seen and how can we put those together to make, it, uh, to make a significant change? Um, we have to elect, we have to make sure we have people coming to vote in safely this uh, election because that is the most critical. I have to say, you know, I'm really filled with hope and optimism. It was tough during the primaries, but this week it's been a fabulous thing to say, yes, we can, as people, this is democracy, right? If we can focus on what do we have as a franchise for democracy, how can we do it? We can do it. You know, in COVID way, yes. Getting out the word, supporting people who are running, you know, and, and translating the translating the, the information and making sure that nobody that wants to vote is left out because they don't understand how to vote in, in absentia or how to, you know, navigate the systems. And also, like I tell other people, because I'm part of a big national, all kinds of national networks of immigrant and immigrant rights, New Hampshire, we are so lucky. We are a small state where we can make a difference. Mm -hmm. I tell your colleague, Manny Espitia, if you were in California as a little young Chicano, you wouldn't be, you wouldn't be counted. Here, you're somebody. You know, anybody that's active, it, you need thick skin, but you can make a difference here. Mm -hmm. And yeah. if we all work together, we can make a difference because it, it, it carries out so much farther than, than in a bigger state. And we have access to our, to our uh, federal senators and our Congress people. And I see in other states, they have never had a meeting with them. They don't, they yeah. don't you know, and here I'm a nobody and they all know me by name. You yeah. know, I don't that's, need that's a very good point, Eva. Yeah. We are the citizen legislation. Yeah. And each one of you running, if you can harness or talk to small groups or reach out to the neighbors and find one or two people from different communities to be the spokesperson. What I, I do is I know my uh, award in each neighborhood. I find one or two people that uh, know me or I engage in conversation and they walk with me and they give me the, uh, you know, so using, you know, and my uh, thing is if I have one person coming to our home, I say, you need to bring 10 people to the polls. You have to reach out to 10 people in your circle. So that's how you multiply and it can be done. It yeah. can be done. And, you know, 7,632 registered voters in my ward. Good. Um, okay, London, everybody. London, thank you. We, we, have, we have to wrap it up so Actually, we all can get ready for wanna, Kamala. I, Gail, yes. I do want to just do one more question because I think this will sum it all up. Um, Marissa asked, how can majority U.S. natives be better advocates for minority non-U.S. natives? 
And I know Eva, you've talked about this. I've heard you talk about it all the time. That's right. Well, established relationship, we have our own voices. Nobody can speak better. Uh, you know, we do not, when you, when the well-meaning allies speak for us and stand in front of us and speak for us, you're perpetuating the same systems of inequity. Uh, you know, if you want to speak for immigrants, you, you stand by them and open the floor for them, open doors for them. Use your white privilege to build a nice platform for the black people and for the for immigrants to speak for themselves. It takes me 10 years to build a relationship with somebody to the point where I can talk to them. It takes you five minutes to make a freaking phone call, you know, and that's a reality. So use your path. I don't need, like I, I tell people, you know, I'm all for marriage equality, but I'm not a lesbian. So I would never speak in front of Bo, stand in front of Mo Baxley and speak for her, but everybody does it in front of us, you know? Mm -hmm. So well-meaning or not, the, your role is use your white privilege to open doors for the, the affected people that you want to help and walk hand in hand with them, but let them do the talking. Share the mic. Can I add something to what Eva just said? This is Ken. Ken, hi Ken. Uh, I, hi, I agree completely with what Eva was just saying. Yeah. Um, and one other thing that mostly we white people can do, if somebody, is, I assume that Al Baldessero shutting down uh, immigrant voices oh, yeah. is, um, it occurs at a public meeting because you're probably not trying to have a conversation with them in your living room. If it's at a public meeting, the chair should shut him down. Okay. It is wrong. Um, and he should not be given that power. And I think that, mm -hmm. you know, accountability comes from the top down. And the sense of we we welcome all voices versus we shut down any people of color and voices we don't agree with, that also comes from the top. And we need to shut that down. The people in power who chair the committee, who chair your town meeting, um, and if they don't shut them down, then we should, uh, as regular citizens, uh, put in a complaint. Yes, I, I, yeah. I, great point, Ken. Great point. Now, I just need to wrap this up. Um, I want to first thank you, Eva. Thank you, Latha. You've been great. Very, uh, really appreciate it. And uh, for everyone else, our next educational series is actually tomorrow, and it's at 530. The topic is economic security, and the panelists will be Brian Sullivan, uh, from, uh, and he's on the Labor Industrial Rehab, he's chair of that, and Amanda Sears from the Family Friendly Economy, she's the New Hampshire director. So thank you everyone, You'll, you can find the recording, you can find the materials online and we'll send them to you and I appreciate everyone for being part of this. It's a great thank session. You. Thank you all Good for giving us. Thank you. you. I Thanks everybody. Yes. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.